about this. What was the last difficult conversation you needed to have or had, or that might be coming up with someone else? Was it with someone who works for you or with you? Was it with a loved one? Maybe one or both of your parents? You know, we have these conversations as adult people um, or with one of your children. Is it with your spouse? Is it with a, a, a just a, a close friend? In my experience, here's the funny thing about these tough conversations. People who think they are good at tough conversations typically have some work to do. And, uh, and those who know they need to do it a little better often are just shy to share that vulnerability that they struggle with this. So here we go. I'm Dr. Rob McKenna, and welcome to The Wild Conversation, where we make the best thinking in psychology, leadership, and organizational science accessible to leaders, we call it bottom shelf, who are willing to learn and edit for their sake and for the sake of others. Uh, and today we're continuing our series on what executives are really talking about. And this week's topic is on how to have tough but important conversations. And uh, as we think about this, you know, the, the series is called "What Executives Are Really Talking About," and this is what they're. They, this is a lot of conversations I've had recently with my CEO and executive friends. Is just that we think that they don't struggle with this anymore, and they still do. And so, in many ways, I, but the reality is, we all do. And so they're thinking about things that we think about. And as many of you have heard me say before, um, we are all about, we are all people who have things that we whisper out loud, but scream out inside of us. And I, I mention that um, because some of those conversations are either difficult to actually have or feel impossible or even reckless to talk about. In, in some situations, it's I think it's because we hold solidarity with that other person and so sharing it with others would be a violation of trust. And so I think this one of the realities of this is that there is we have to be thoughtful about what we bring and are vulnerable about because sometimes it might be it might frankly be inappropriate to get help because we can't talk about the actual conversation because we might hold solidarity with someone else. But that conversation is still likely to be necessary but still tough. And I think it might surprise some of you I mentioned this that that some of the CEOs that are close friends of mine that I've been in, in conversations with over the last few months continue to struggle with having these tough conversations, but they do. And uh, Dr. Daniel and I just got back from working with 20 CEOs over the last couple of days. And I can tell you that our experience was that most all of them have a tough conversation coming up with a spouse, a child, a vice president on their team, or a longtime customer. It's just something is coming up, and the best ones know that they could do better. And converse, some of them are conversations with people they've been married to for years um, that have a lot of baggage around them, tough conversations with senior leaders on their teams, or even those teams having a conversation with the CEO themselves, um, and differences of opinions between leaders in different functional areas, taking things personally. Um, Kids who aren't quite prepared to take over the business, they but think they are. Parents who aren't handing over the reins of the business as well as they could. Um, these difficult but important conversations are many. Um, they are the norm and they are a part of life and work, but they're they're a tough part. And I'd love for you to take a moment before I'm, I'm going to get this. I, this week is going to be, I hope, pretty practical. And I also know that that uh, Daniel says this about me often. Like as I express these things. These are things I practice. They're not things I've mastered, you know? So these are things that I continue to practice. And they are, there's some crowdsourced wisdom in this from dear mentors of mine. There's a little bit of research that's a part of this. But I'd love for you to take a moment to think of a tough but important conversation coming up for you. Or that you know you need to have. Okay, everybody take that moment. Just think, what is a conversation that's coming up for you? or that, that maybe you need to have. Um, and here's some things to think about. There are so many moving pieces of conversations like these. There's first of all, the level of difficulty, right? We could rate these things on a scale from one to 10. Like how difficult is it? There's the reason it's difficult. Like what is the core reason, which, which is it's a lot to talk about in that space. There's the complexity of the relationship or relationships. There's like others, other people who are involved, that complexity, uh, maybe a history. Maybe this is a conversation you've had over and over and over again. There's um, anxiety over hurt feelings. That's part of the complexity. And there's sometimes there's power differentials. 
that are a part of that. And doesn't you don't have to even be a working person to know that there are power differences we might perceive in that. There's the importance of the outcome, like how much weight is on the outcome that that sort of probably affects the difficulty. But but those are some of the things that I think that are characteristics. But why are these why are these difficult conversations so powerful? And the first thing is this: that they demand something from us that in other situations can be ignored. They demand something, and I'm not going to say what those things are because I think it's different things for different ones of us. But they demand something from us. The second thing is that they often involve us in relationships to an other or others. So there's often a risk. There's a there's a change. There's a there's a change possibility and a risk. Um, number three is they're also powerful because they require us to understand and clarify our position. And not just that, but to clear to, to communicate it well. Um, my fourth thing is that they involve the practice of some of the most important actions that deepen our character in ways we cannot imagine without them. Yeah. Like what do diff, what do tough conversations have to do with character? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. They require forgiving, forgiveness or forgiving. Um, they might. They they might require us to receive or offer grace. Uh, they highlight our need for patience and they often require us to understand ourselves and others better because they're real and so much of our working lives and even the rest of our lives allows us to avoid removing the veil that covers us so much of the time. It's just like they're very, it creates a vulnerability and a realness that can be difficult. And in most, most every case, fundamentally, they involve change. They involve some sort of change in us or in others or in our relationship to others or in how we're going to be and work together. And as many of you know, one of the pieces that I've given much of my life and career to as a scientist and as someone invested in developing leader capacity is what we describe as leading under pressure or leadership differentiation. And we have all kinds of content. I wrote a whole book about it called Composed. It is it is something I have to just, just mention um, because while in, while increasing our capacity to lead well under pressure is not all about difficult conversation, the reality conversations, the real reality is that a majority of high pressure moments involve a leader or a person having a tough conversation with a coworker, employee, family member, or friend. In fact, I would say that tough but important conversations are the most common and prevalent high pressure moments that most people describe when they think about pressure. So it's not all about that, but it's important. And I tell you this because, Increasing our capacity to have tough conversations well is so much more than a simple practice or set of advice. I am going to I am going to spend some time in that space, but it requires an understanding of ourselves in relationship to others in a much deeper way. Um, and so there is a there is a whole conversation around what this is about. And what while we might not have to go into therapy to get better at them, which I or understand our family of origin and the patterns that shaped our capacity to deal with these high pressure moments. And I'm I'm saying like therapy has been a good thing in my life, <laughs> although it might, might help many of us. We do need a deeper level of thinking and awareness if we're to get better at having these conversations. And I would say that this is also we talked about this as a team that the whole intentional work we do with leadership teams and increasing the the capacity of team members to have hard conversations. Um, that's part of what happens as a as a result of investing in leaders in a whole and intentional kind of way. Um, because we we found that those teams become more aware of one another, more aware of themselves, and they enter into these conversations better. So some of the things that um, so the question like is, is this is so where do we start? Where do we start? And there there is a whole story of these conversations. So I just want to give you some before I get into the practice of the actual conversation, because I'm going to give you that. I want to give you some things to think about that are <laughs> pretty provocative for me and and challenging. Um, and so this would, this is the assumption that we have a little bit of preparation because you're all here. So you have moments If this is coming. You have some time to prepare, hopefully. So here's the first one. Where do we start? Number one, let go of the outcome. Let go of the outcome for the sake of simply being clear. This is big and it is counterintuitive. We have to focus on having the conversation for the sake of the conversation because it's the right thing to do 
and not because we expect them to change. That is a crazy proposition. If we have tough, tough conversations with the intent to change someone else, here's the crazy part. We lose the power of the conversation. And I don't know if it's an irony. Some of you are going to correct me on this, but ironically, the power and the possibility that they will or they will ever change. So it's interesting is that, sure, it increases, it inc <laughs> letting go of the outcome increases the possibility that we'll get the outcome, but we can't do it for the sake of the outcome. We have to do it for the sake of being a differentiated version of ourselves and being clear about our position, but also connected to this other person. Okay, so that's number one. That one, just wrap your brain around that. I have to remind myself of that one all the time. Number two, be open to changing. This is a hard one for me as I think about this personally. Enter into it with the openness to the possibility that you will change your mind without losing yourself in the process. Like that we don't go into these conversations just to convince someone else. Like number one and two makes me think of how many of you have been convinced by someone's post on social media about their position that you disagree with to change your mind? Because if the intent in the post was to change your mind, they've lost the power of it in the first place. So it's uh, so in this, it's like, what if we enter into these conversations with the openness to maybe I will actually, I feel convicted by this right now because I have one coming up be open to the possibility that it's me that's going to change in it, but actually opens up potential. I think for me, that kind of sets me free a little bit too. Number three, get surrounded by great feedback and support. I have a friend of mine that told me early on who had been married longer than I have. And when, when I went through some difficult times, you know, if any of you have been married, you have difficult times, right? I'm not the only one. Um, it's uh, and he said, he reminded me, he says this to, to this day, he goes seasons, things happen in seasons. And that, that mantra has really been powerful in my life. So that support for these conversations can really help. Number four, understand your emotional defaults. Understand that we all don't deal with these things differently. And there's a whole, you know, as I said, I, I wrote a book about this, but we have all kinds of resources and, and previous wild conversations and podcasts that talk about some of us are more attentive to what's going on in others. And some of us are more attentive to what's going on in us and understanding that our, our emotional defaults is a powerful place to begin. And then number five is this, is to be strategic. And what I mean by that is that it's, it's one thing to understand your emotional default to either people please or to truth speak, but that we actually could be strategic. And so we have strategies that we aren't going to get into today um, that can help you in these conversations. And one of the most powerful ones that you've heard me talk about before is clarifying your sense of purpose. Why are you in the situation in the first place? If I'm having a conversation, I bring up this example with my 21-year-old son, specifically, why am I his dad in this season of our lives? We know from the research that, that will help these things go better. So while we can, we can, go, we can grow in our skills and confidence to have these conversations, um, no one gets to the point where they master every tough one. Um, and if you're not having these conversations anymore, if things don't feel tough anymore, or at least conversations that you perceive that way, there's a chance you've either you've either cut off, you've closed off to close relationships, or you've cut off any chances for others to have a deeper relationship or connection to you. And so I think this is something for most of us, it just continues. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts. Like, what do we know about how to do this? Some of you are like, okay, give me the practice, Rob. I got it coming up. What am I going to do? Um, and some of this, I'm beg borrowing and stealing from one of my uh, mentors, uh, Tim Weber, who really helped me through some of this process, who had pulled in research on this as well. The number one, the, not number one, here's the order of things. The first thing is this, frame. I call this the word before the word. This is all about clarifying your intent. This is all about framing. Um, and by, by the way, for those of you who like to get to the point and just state your opinion in these conversations, this will feel like a waste of time. So I'm begging you to believe that it's not. Um, and for those of you who care deeply about others are feeling and thinking about you, this 30 seconds of framing in this conversation that you begin with will feel like an eternity, but it's important. Take a moment to clarify your intent. That's important, not only for you, but for the person with whom you're having the conversation. Framing is about clarifying your purpose for the relationship and conversation that precedes what you, what you want, what you are going to say, what you want to see change. So here's an example. 
this is me trying to act, which is horrible. Hey, Jim, um, I'm having this conversation with you because our relationship matters to me. And I want to be as truthful as possible while also hearing your thoughts. My intent is to describe to you what's important to me um, and, and also to hear you. But I want to be clear about what I see happening. Does that make sense? So this is intent. He's and now Jim's the reason why this feels like an eternity is Jim's like, what are you going to say? Like what's coming, you know, but clarifying the intent, clarifying the purpose is the, is the best place to start. If it was a conversation with an employee or a VP who is causing problems, I might say, <laughs> and it has to be the truth it has to be coming from the state of what I believe is true. My intent is to be as direct as possible with you, but also to hear you out. My understanding is that you are feeling some dissatisfaction with the way I've been leading. And my intent is to give you my position and hear yours. I can't promise you an outcome that will you'll agree with, but I hope that we can get there. So I just whatever it is to clarify the intent. Number two, express. I call this data and interpretation. <laughs> say what you're going to say. I, I like here's an example. I've seen the way you're treating others on your team, and if this is um. If this is true, it's not consistent with our team charter that clearly states our aspirations for how we agreed to treat each other. Your reactivity in meetings and your unwillingness to listen to others and talk over them or even to check out is hurting the effectiveness of our overall team. And we've had this conversation several times, as you know. So at this point, it's time for you to go. <laughs> I'm just, it's uh, the last part I kind of tapped on at the end. You may not say that last part if it's not that moment. Maybe you haven't had this conversation many times. But the point is this, the second part too is to express. The third rhythm in the conversation is, is what I call test. And so it's soliciting a reaction. Can you tell me what you heard? Um, can I understand how, you, how you're reacting to that? And the moment in this moment, the, the point is to remain objective and calm if you can um, and grab tightly to, the, to, the, to purpose over outcome. At this point, especially in this, this third phase, is grab tightly to why you are in it over the what you want to see change. Because grabbing onto the outcome will put you in a state of either reactivity or fear that um, will probably be unhelpful. And then the, number four, so we've gone through framing, we've expressed, we've tested the response, and now number four is what I call inquire. And this is your action related to their reaction. Okay, I hear you, and here's my response. Um, and so that might be another test, uh, you know, another moment to express again, and this is what we should try. Um, and by the way, if there's something you should take responsibility for, as I mentioned, where you might discover there were things that you were wrong about, this would be a nice moment to do that as you realize you heard their reaction. But one of the main points is to remain present and composed during this conversation. Now, that, those are those four steps. I use them all the time in tough conversations. And I, I want to just give you a couple more thoughts before we get out and get out and talk about this. Here's a couple of just quick hits. That's how to have it. Here's a couple of quick hits. Avoid hyperbole. Statements like you never do this aren't helpful because they're almost never true. Um, number two, use the situation and the data over making it personal. If you can, if you can talk about the situation over, over making personal statements, that's helpful. Number three, remind yourself that change takes time. It will not be one conversation likely that will change the direction of this ship. Um, stay true to that purpose you describe, why you're in it. And I would say this finally also, for those of you that struggle in these conversations, restating and re-expressing exactly what you said when you expressed is sometimes okay. Do you hear me? Like if someone's giving you the same response, restating your your position without a reactive response just being clear and stating your position again three or four times sometimes is necessary you don't have to restate it differently um and and i think that that's one one other possibility and the hope is that we'll get better at this you all i hope this this some of these steps help but i know that we're going to crowdsource some wisdom now so i'd love to hear you talking about what it, what about this was helpful um as we go forward